The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them the fire of thy love. Set forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by that same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us. And may the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest, rest in peace. peace. Amen. And O Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hello, and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V. And he's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. How are you this evening? Well, Father, thanks for being here. Yeah, very well, certainly. Father, I thought we could start tonight with an article from the Crooks News website. This really caught my eye the other day. The, the title of this article is New Book Highlights Jesuit Trailblazer and Surrender to God. This article references a Father Jeffrey Kirby, who is an author and a Crooks columnist, and he has come out with a new book titled Be Not Troubled. And he says that uh, he draws in this book a lot upon the writings of Father Jean-Pierre de Caussade, the author of the very famous Self-Abandonment to Divine Providence book. And uh, I just thought this is absolutely fascinating, Father, to read through some of the, the quotes from this Father Kirby. And he says the, the reason that he wrote this book, Be Not Troubled, is because, quote, I kept hearing people say that the church didn't have anything to help them in their spiritual lives. Uh, people wanted to truly draw closer to God, but they didn't know how to do it, and they didn't know of anything in the church's vast spiritual treasury. Father, is that not absolutely astounding that by his own admission here, his own people, they, did, they, they said that in the church's history, there was nothing. They didn't have anything to help them with their spiritual lives. How absolutely, what an admission that is. Well, Tom, remember now, he's talking about the Novus Ordo. Right. Okay, he's talking about the Novus Ordo. And, I mean, in terms of the Novus Ordo and its origins, um, finally, kind of its gestation with the modernists before Vatican II and its, its birth at Vatican II, the Novus Ordo, the New Order. Really, they've got, uh, what have they got? They've got Terre de Chardin, right? Hans Urs von Balthasar, right? Uh, they, they've got a number of, uh, of modernist authors, uh, and uh, that's all they've got. And, and no wonder the people who are part of the Novus Ordo and are caught in the Novus Ordo, I should say the modernist net of the Novus Ordo, they really have nothing. You know? uh, largely they've rejected the writings of the Fathers, as St. Pius X said that the modernists do, right? He wrote that in his encyclical on modernism, that the modernists reject the fathers, and uh, they're looking for essentially new doctrines. So, um, and and certainly the idea of the the true Catholic uh, spiritual writers doesn't resonate in the Novus Ordo. Now there there are certain you know good souls who still have the old faith who are caught up in the Novus Ordo who are looking for something to inspire them, and they're not going to find it in Laudato Si, or Populorum Progressio, or anything like that, right, of the new church, um, in the encyclicals of the pontiffs of the Novus Ordo, or any of the modernist, uh, you know, featured authors. So um, I could see why a Novus Ordo Catholic uh, born and bred in the Novus Ordo would say there is nothing to foster my spiritual life any more than the, no, the new, mass, new Mass itself feeds a spiritual life. You know? it's, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, it's empty, it's void, it's, it's vacant. 
But Father, I, th I thought this is this is really interesting. He says that after he he um, had had these uh, interviews with people where they told him this, he said that uh, Kirby, Father Kirby, said that he turned to the quote spiritual masters end quote of Christian tradition who might have helpful reflections, and one of them was Father de Cassad. Now you know that is interesting that once he has people say. Father Kirby, there is nothing for me, right, mm -hmm. to nourish my spiritual life. Then he goes and he goes back and refers to the spiritual master. Right. It's like he discovers them, right, as though exactly. he hadn't really been aware of them before, right? Exactly. And he discovers uh, Dom uh, de Gossard, right? Right. Okay. And and what did he discover? Uh, well. <laughs> He didn't discover the Nova Sorda there, did he? <laughs> well, he would, like to, he would like to think so, Father. He says that uh, Father de Cassad presents us with a type of methodology that can be used in dissecting and digesting the teachings of Pope Francis or any of the writings of the spiritual masters in the Christian tradition, noting that there are similar tones to both Francis and de Cassad's writings. Well, that's a stretch. Um... Let's see, I suppose they would use the same page numbering <laughs> uh, um, in Arabic numerals. Uh, but uh, I can't imagine what else you would see, um, aside from the fact that they're using the same English words, uh, they certainly don't use them in the same combination to convey the, sa convey the same thought. Well, or is, is that what he's saying? They actually the, convey uh, the same meaning? The article says, according to Kirby, key themes in Dick Assad's writings include his development of God's permissive will in relation to evil, as well as his concept of the sacrament of the present moment, which is a central theme in Be Not Troubled. So he, um, he likes to focus a lot on God's permissive will and says how Francis really likes his permissive will, how God permits evil to happen. And uh, he, he likes to compare what Francis says about this and what Father Dick Assad says about this and, says, and tries to say that they are saying the same thing, when in reality, it's nothing, <clears throat> nothing alike. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, absolutely diametrically opposed the one to the other, right? It, in fact, so much so that it really does approach an absurdity to try to compare them, right? I mean, Dom de Assad talks about the need of, of the human will to submit to the will of God and to accept the hardships and the crosses of life as permitted by God for our own sanctification and that they are actually opportunities for us to receive grace from God, cooperate with grace, carry the cross after our Lord, mm -hmm. make an act of, of trust in God, right? And so when he says, be not troubled, he's saying that the soul should recognize the providence of God in all that happens, right? And that God is still in control and he still loves us. He's providing the graces we need to sanctify our souls and to save our souls. Um, we should have that constant, um, that constant conviction, that constant confidence in God in everything that happens and be not troubled by anything. Right. right. And now, St. Teresa, the child Jesus, also conveys the, that idea in her little way, too, right? <clears throat> but Francis's idea <clears throat> is not that at all. I mean, uh, the confusion that he, that he wreaks uh, in the minds of those who would be faithful uh, is truly an evil that God permits. Francis himself, though, has not, um, uh, to my knowledge, made a great deal of use of the idea of God's permissive will. <clears throat> um, that whole question of God's permissive will came up with Francis when Francis uh, made the statement that God wills the diversity of religions. And um, so there were those who were trying to understand what Francis said or interpret it or spin that to be compatible with the Catholic faith because it would be heretical to say that God directly wills these things as though they were, they were goods, you know. False religions cannot be good. And so they were trying to say, well, Francis must mean it is God's permissive will that God allows them or tolerates them. 
there were problems with that interpretation, though, because Francis lumped the diversity of religions with a number of other things that God does will as positive goods. And he throws in this diversity of religions and this list of other things that are actually good things. Right? He doesn't distinguish. And so um, they're trying to pluck this out of the fire, as it were, to say, well, he really must have meant that. So Bishop Schneider actually asked him, well, you, you meant this, didn't you? And Francis' answer was, well, you, you can say that. You can say that, right? Later on, Francis repeated that idea, uh, that this is God's permissive will, okay? However, this also left him uh, holding a rather un-Catholic bag because he thereby implies that Islam, for example, and false religions are evils that God tolerates because that's God's permissive will. He, he, he tolerates evil, right? And uh, so as soon as he uses that category of thought that this is God's permissive will, he's branding false religions, the multiplicity of religions, as an evil that God tolerates, which is not very politically correct these days. So he wants to downplay that at the same time. He's being pressed to say it. See? So, uh, but later on, by the way, still later on after that, he came out and he indicated that, yes, the diversity of religions is a good thing. He actually did come out and say that. The diversity of religion is a good thing, not just tolerated as an evil. <clears throat> and so this is, this is modern, modernist talk. St. Pius X says a modernist contradicts himself <clears throat> continually uh, for the sake of sowing confusion. That's the whole idea. And throwing people off the scent, too, so that nobody can point at him and say, well, what you said was heretical, without somebody else coming along and saying, well, that's what he said there, but look what he said here, you know? So that's, that's more like Catholic, sort of, you know? And then they get into a big squabble of what he really said and what he really meant, okay? Meanwhile, he just sits back and lets others kind of spin it for him and let some Vatican spokesman come up and try to, uh, <clears throat> try to interpret it in, in a certain way, you know? Um, what do they call it? Well, spin. I guess they call it spin, right? But, um, but, you know, what we're dealing with in Francis here is massive confusion about the faith when he's not contradicting it. Remember, remember we talked about the different categories of error. We talked about something being offensive to pious ears. We talked about something being a, uh, an opinion proximate to heresy, and so on. These are all categories, theological categories, of errors that the church assigns to things. And uh, Francis is continually um, saying things that are offensive to pious ears, uh, savoring of heresy, and so on. Uh, even if one wants to bicker about whether it's actually heretical or not, or whether he's pertinacious in his heresy, um, so much of what he says is, is in, in the, some category that the church has used to condemn uh, statements as being um, inimical to the faith. And uh, so if, Dom, if, if this uh, Father Kirby is trying to tell us that Dom Kossad is telling us, is, was telling us in his writings about you know, self-abandonment to divine providence and trust in the will of God and his providence, that the confusion that Francis is wreaking in the church, in the minds of Catholic or would-be Catholic people, is something that God really just wants us to bow our heads and accept and trust and you know, think that, that, that that's going to lead to sanctity. That's not at all what Dom Kossad said. Dom Kossad was not talking about the confusion of the faith. He was talking about the faithful not knowing God, what God's will is, but trusting, but trusting that God will see that they do it and will give them the grace to accomplish it, even though they don't understand or know where God, why God is asking them to do this or suffer that or, or endure this cross. They have this trust, okay? 
for him to suggest that this, in a, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, the inability of the individual Catholic person to know, you know, what God's intention is here, what God's ultimate plan is here, but one must just trust, is absolutely uh, not at all, and is the opposite of what Francis calls the spirit of surprises. That God is surprising me now by putting this cross on me and I have to carry this uh, patiently and trustingly. That is not Francis's message. Uh, the message Francis is talking about is, is merely, is not even the toleration of evil. Because one, with Dom Kassad, you could say, okay, well God tolerates this evil that I have to carry this cross, but he tolerates it because he brings from it the greater good by giving me the grace to accept it out of love and trust for him. But Francis is not saying that here. You know, it's almost laughable that he calls him like one of the spiritual masters or something like that. Francis is actually getting the message across that the, what the church has always called evil is good. This is the problem. You know, he's referring to these, these evil things, the multiplicity of false religions that are invented by human beings, as something that God really wants to happen. <clears throat> because they're, in this, they're actually good things. And, uh, I mean, even in his uh, Amoris Laetitia, where he talks about the status of people who are living in adultery, and he basically says, well, that's the best they can do under the circumstances. And if they were to try to stop living in adultery, and try to stop committing adultery, it would just make things worse, right? I mean, he at least implies that, if doesn't gotten say it, and say it outright. But there are others who, interpreting his words, have come out and said that. His own, his own hierarchy, his own bishops, you know, have come out and said this. And, uh, you know, to, um, to say something like that, is is wrong. It is it is blasphemous. It is uh, it is downright evil, and uh, that's the problem. Francis is doing what the prophet Isaiah uh, says is 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 draws God's anger and vengeance. Woe to those who call good evil and who call evil good. And this is the problem we're dealing with with Francis. <laughs> That is not the teaching of Dom Cossad, Dom de Cossad, or any of the spiritual writers of the Catholic Church. No. And Father, I think another thing that just shows the, uh, the absurdity of this attempt at a comparison between Francis and Father Dick Sod is that uh, Francis' obsession with poverty and redistribution of wealth. You know, if you, you read through Self-Abandonment to Divine Providence, there's page after page, like you said, are just accepting God's will, accepting what, what God has in store for you because it's the best possible thing. It comes from his from God's infinitely loving hand. And then if you were to suddenly insert some of Francis's uh, teachings on poverty and the necessity of redistributing wealth and uh, and and all of that, it's totally out of place. It, it's directly contrary to what he says of accepting of accepting God's will. And I think um, if one were to do that, take, take some of Francis's writings or, or his homilies, insert those into self man to divine providence, you can see the contracts could not be more mm -hmm. stark. It's Absolutely. It's mystifying. I mean, every now and then, someone in the Nova Soros says something that is so blatantly ridiculous that it's very hard to, to even try to reason through it. It takes you a while. It's almost breathtakingly absurd. And you try to reason through it because it's the opposite of the truth. I mean, there's, there are lies that are just not, not, not true. But there, there are lies that are the opposite of the truth. They're so bold and so brazen. And this is what we're dealing with in modernism. Mm -hmm. And so to posit a thesis like that in a book, I, th I think what it shows, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, this, the author is a bad, bad, evil person now to, you know, waylay souls and, and send them to hell. I, I, gather, I would take it into face value that he's, he thinks he's doing a good thing. He's trying to decipher things in a... In a good way, a spiritual, helpful way, but I think what it shows is the the absolute poverty of the Novus Ordo. That they really are grasping for straws to find some vestige of real spiritual spirituality. And then to to reinterpret, imagine if I went back and reinterpreted Saint Augustine 
in order to bring St. Augustine into line with Teilhard de Chardin, one of the, one of the modernist masters, right? That would be an atrocity. Well, it's no less an atrocity to go back and try to reinterpret Dom de la Cassade, I mean, Dom de Cassade in such a way that he's now brought into line with Francis. That is really doing violence to, uh, to the, to the <clears throat> true meaning of it, uh, Dom de Cassade or any true Catholic writer. Sure. And Father, I think to... Um you know, as you said, he he might have a, a good or a good intention in this, and um, I think this this is just really sad to read. In the very beginning, he says that uh, this Father Kirby, when he first started reading the uh, self abandonment to divine providence, he had difficulty understanding what the Jesuit theologian was trying to say, and he found the message very confusing. And it wasn't until much later on in his life when he could apply some of his writings to his own personal life, his own personal experiences, that he began to grasp and understand what uh, the self abandonment to divine providence idea was all about. And I just found that really striking, Father, because the whole... Well, you've read... I have. Dom de Cassandre, and you know it's not rocket it's, science. It's, it's beautiful, <laughs> He even says... Uh, basic, that's, spiritual... That's one of the meditation. main points of the book, is, is he says over and over again that this is the simplest possible method to sanctity, because mm -hmm. he says... He starts out the book by making the comparison of... Um, you know, back when we had all the, the, the patriarchs and, and all of that, before uh, sanctity was reduced to arts and, and very specific science. He says, no doubt we need that in our present time. But back then, you know, you think about it, there was no um, no visible church. With, there was no commandments, nothing that they, well, nothing, no church commandments, nothing that they had to follow um, the letter of the law like that. It was, Who is that? Before the, in the Old Testament. So well, in the Old Testament, that has uh, rather reg regimented. Right, but right. but in the the very beginning of time, he says how um, you yeah, know you're talking about back Abraham. Right, Isaac, exactly. Jacob, all so. all they had to do their 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 road to sanctity was simply to follow the will of God to perform their duty well at every at each successive moment in their life. And there's nothing simpler than that concept. Even a, the the smallest child could understand that. You just tell them. All you have to do is do what God wants you to do, yeah. and that's it. It's the simplest. And Abraham would be the prime example of that. Exactly. It's the simplest possible thing to understand, mm -hmm. and yeah, he says that he was very confused. Well, it's a book confused. that, you know, housewives and uh, even even young people read, teenagers, and they, I, I can't imagine why he would find it so mystifying and that it would take some sort of uh, uh, development to even understand it. I would I would suggest that any of our if any of our listeners have not read the book Self Abandonment to Divine Providence by Dom Kassad, to get a hold of that book it's it's very readily available and um, to read the book and I think they will they'll benefit greatly from it and I think if they recall this uh, Novus Ordo priest's uh, difficulty in trying to understand it, I think they'll be, they'll wonder, but I think they'll even wonder more as to how we could possibly interpret this in such a way that it has anything to do with the, the, the teachings or, or the, the blatherings of Francis. There is a way, there is a way though, there is certainly a way in which the writings of Dom de Cassade would apply to Francis, and that is the evil, and how to deal with evil things and the evils of his confusing and sometimes out-and-out -out blasphemous teachings. And we might wonder now, traditional Catholics wonder, well, why would God permit this to happen? How could God permit the church to be undergoing through the, go through this passion? And we remember, of course, that the church is truly the mystical body of Christ, and the church must go through uh, the, the same passion and suffering of our, that our Lord went through. And so we find that what Don de Gossard says applies to us here and now with regard to all of the evil things we have to put up with. But now it applies in a special way to what's happening with the modernists and the Novus Ordo, as we see the church spat upon and scourged and crowned with thorns, loaded with the cross, and driven through the streets to be crucified. 
we, we, we have to realize that even here, we have to trust in God's providence and have absolute confidence in his love for us and his love for souls and, and his power by grace to sanctify the souls, uh, not because I've been in spite of these things, right? So, um, it, yes, it is still possible to, to be faithful to God even under these circumstances, to be faithful to him, uh, to hold fast to the traditional faith and to practice the traditional faith in the traditional mass and traditional sacraments and not to follow the modernists. Uh, following Christ is one thing, as he's being uh, driven through the, the streets uh, to, to crucifixion. But we're, the following Christ is, as, that, as that is happening is not the same as following the modernists who are driving him through the streets with the whips and, and so on. So it is Christ whom we're following, not the modernists. That's what we always have to keep in mind and realize it is the modernists who are really the ones who are perpetrating the, uh, the, the crimes against the church now. In fact, so much so that they're drawing the civil governments of the world to, to oppress the church by, by laws, by your laws now. Right, they're drawing the the animosity of the world um, by by the crimes that they're committing in the name of the Catholic Church. And so, yes, we will have to be dealing with that also. <clears throat> right. But again, we bow our heads and uh, follow our Lord That's in right. His passion. Well, Father, we'll certainly keep this Father Jeffrey Kirby in our prayers as well as. Uh, Francis and his whole Nova Sordo church. The Father, I'd like to get into this. There's a, uh, as you know, a certain dogmatic Seda Vicantist website who uh, wrote up a short response to some of our recent programs where you've been talking about the question of Seda Vicantism and, and some of the other terms that you have uh, put forth. And uh, this website, Father, I'll withhold their name, they say here, no state of a contest pretends to have authority to bind consciences. We only point out the necessary conclusion that Francis cannot be a true pope if the church's doctrine of the papacy is true. Protecting the papacy from the pope is absurd. How would you respond to that, Father? Well, I would thank that writer because he proves exactly my point. He, he exactly proves my point. Well, in the first place, I'm talking about the dogmatic state of a contest, okay? Who <clears throat> consider it to be a matter of Catholic teaching or doctrine that Francis or the Novus Ordo Popes are not popes, and you have to believe that is true in order to be Catholic, okay? They, they, they talk as though if you, if you believe that any of them were popes or even think that they were popes, that somehow you are less than Catholic for believing that or thinking that. And you certainly cannot legitimately practice the traditional Catholic faith. If you believe that any of the of us are popes <clears throat> were true popes or might have been popes. Okay. Uh, this is what I mean by a dogmatic state of accountist who has taken his own personal conclusion and raised it to the level of a dogma so that he anathematizes anybody who disagrees with him, right? Now this writer says, well, I don't do that. So maybe he's saying, well, I'm not one of those dogmatic state of accountants you're talking about. And say, well, okay, uh, what you say after that would indicate that you're not a dogmatic state of accountants. But I know there are dogmatic state of accountants so whether I'm talking about this individual or not, well, that's up to him to decide whether it applies to him or not. He obviously uh, is writing what he's saying in a reply in his own mind, a reply to what I'm saying. So whatever he's thinking, I'm, I, what I understand from his saying is this, I'm not one of those people you're talking about, okay? And then he goes on to say, we're merely drawing the conclusion, right? The inevitable conclusion that... This is absurd to think, you know, they are, but the very fact that he's saying that and even using that terminology uh, indicates, he says it's a matter of logic. It's a matter of drawing a logical conclusion. 
And that's my whole point. If you see that, if you reached this conclusion, even as a conviction, as a result of a logical process, and you come to the conclusion, therefore, Francis cannot be the Roman pontiff, the vicar of Christ on earth, and so on, could not, you know, be the bishop of Rome and the successor of Peter. He can't be, logically. Fine. You know, you can draw that conclusion very logically. But you can't say, because I've drawn this logical conclusion, anybody who doesn't agree with it is not a Catholic. I can't say because I've come to this logical conclusion and anything contrary to it seems absurd because, again, absurdity is a logical, a logical fallacy, right? It's a matter of logic. It's a matter of human reasoning here to see that these things to both can't be true. There's a contradiction between them, right? So, <laughs> again, that's the result of a logical process. And the, the result of a logical process does not yield a dogma. And so that's why I say these dogmatic state of accountists, in following their premises uh, with the facts that they know or think they know and the principles of the church that they know or think they know, and they draw the conclusion that Francis cannot be a true pope, that they have reached a logical conclusion and they can discuss it as a logical conclusion. But they can't anathematize people who don't necessarily agree with them because it's still only a logical or theological conclusion. It's not a dogma. They do, they do not ha represent the ordinary or the extraordinary magisterium of the church to make an infallible pronouncement on the subject, okay? That's all I'm saying. And it, 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 this man is saying the same thing. He, he may have re not realized it, but he's saying the same thing on him. But what about this idea uh, where he says uh, you can, the idea of protecting the papacy from the pope is absurd? Well, uh, he... <laughs> What he's saying is simply false, and manifestly so. Um, I mean, when Honorius I um, decreed silence, ordered silence, and all the, the Catholic people about the matter of monothelitism, monophysitism, uh, the, the errors are very closely related, saying that we should not argue about whether Jesus Christ had a human will. A functioning human will. Uh, Honorius I, Pope Honorius I, was basically not only defending the true faith, but he was ordering the Catholic people to be silent and that they should not profess the faith. And uh, now no one has claimed that Honorius was not a pope. He's listed continually as a pope. He's referred to as a pope, okay? He did not profess the heresy. He just didn't profess the faith in opposition to the heresy, and he ordered the faithful to be silent about the heresy and not argue the point. That was his great crime, for which the church actually lists him practically as a heretic, because he was favoring the heresy. But again, um, even though he was anathematized and excommunicated from the church uh, just a generation after his death, by subsequent popes and an ecumenical council of the church, the argument was never made that he wasn't a pope. Um, so, I mean, there you have a, a very good example, a very clear example of trying to save the papacy from the failings of a pope. Right. And the same with uh, another famous example of John the Twenty Second, who denied that the the souls of the just who die um, in the state of grace can go to heaven, can actually be in heaven until the end of the world, until the general judgment. Uh, so the honor we pay to the saints here on earth is kind of a fiction because they're not in heaven, they're not in the beatitude, they can't be until the general judgment at the end of the world. And yes, uh, John the 22nd was fiercely opposed there were those who questioned whether or not he had defected from the faith back then, and perhaps questioning whether he was even pope. But the problem is that with that, he did not profess that heresy as the Roman pontiff. He wasn't writing it into the catechisms. Right? He wasn't standing up saying, this is magisterium, this is magisterial authority. 
This was his own personal theological opinion as a theologian. He wasn't teaching it as a matter of faith. So uh, with Francis, he says everything he says is magisterium, <clears throat> right? Uh, and he even has gone so far as to explicitly include uh, his teachings in Amorius Laetitia, notably chapter 8, the infamous chapter 8, as magisterial teaching of Francis. So Francis has gone far beyond any John the Twenty Second or Honorius the First in his attacks on the faith, which gives us a, this unique situation here uh, in the history of the church. But Tom, um, the fact is there have been cases where the church had to protect the papacy from an errant pope. And this, this writer knows that. He knows it. You can be sure of it if you got to talk to him about it. He would admit, well, yeah, the, the, those were two cases of that. But he might be trying to, he might be thinking of something else. You know, he might be thinking, well, obviously, if you have to protect the papacy from the pope, then he can't really be a pope. But in in Francis's case, uh, and by the way, I mean, I, I agree with him in his logical conclusion. I mean, and he knows that. I agree. I agree it was logical conclusion that you put all the facts together as we know them and you come to the conclusion, well, yes, how is it possible? You know, it does seem absurd to think that he could be the Roman pontiff and the vicar of Christ on earth with what he's saying and especially what he's doing to the church. He's, he's attacking it on every level. Um, even the institution itself, the church, he's, just, he's attacking it continually. He, he wants to, as Cardinal Maraviaga says, his, his right-hand man, the leader of his little special council, the cabal that's uh, rewriting the structure, of the, the authority structure of the church, right? This Cardinal Maraviaga says that Francis wants to change the church in such a way that it is irreversible. You heard him say that, right? That there's no way back to what the church was before. That's what Francis is going with to change it so much and so completely that it makes an entirely different uh, institution and there's no way to recover <clears throat> from what Francis has done and return to what the church was before. So that is something, this is something mind-bogglingly evil, something totally contrary to the whole idea of the, uh, the charisms of infallibility and indefectibility of the church, right? Francis wants to defeat those, okay? Um, so, I mean, we have a situation here which has taken the statement of St. John, uh, St. Robert Bellarmine, if a pope would do something injurious to the church or harmful to souls, that the Catholic must not only refuse to obey him, but must impede the execution of his will. Well, we have this... Um, multiplied a million times over in Francis, right? He was doing everything he can to destroy, ev to destroy everything he can. And uh, so I, I agree with the logical conclusion of this man very, very much. But the trouble is I agree also that it is a logical conclusion and that it can't, not, can't be a dogma. My, my point to the conservative Novus Ordo people out there is, look, the very least you have to be able to admit in your own mind and heart is that there is certainly a doubt. There's clearly a doubt about the papacy of Francis Jorge Bergoglio. There's a doubt about whether he is or can be the Pope. And um, you, you'd have to admit that logically yourselves because you're saying that the circumstances we're facing now really are unprecedented. Even as you look back in time in the history of the church and you try to say, well, look what happened at the time of Honorius, look what happened at the time of John XXII. But you're admitting that with Jorge Bergoglio, it's gone much, much farther than any of them. It's not only a difference in degree, it's a difference in order. It's a, it's a different species here. Right? It's a different kind of thing we're dealing with. It's modernism. So um, you can't anticipate what the judgment of the church will be. And so you have to be open to the fact that, yes, there is a doubt. And um, we have to express that doubt now and be mindful of that because by expressing the doubt and calling into doubt 
whether he has the authority to do what he does, then we're taking the power away from him to do the damage. We take, we, then we cannot say, well, he's the Pope, what he's doing, uh, he has the right to do, he has the power to do, and we just have to accept it. Well, we don't. We have the, uh, our, they have the obligation to reject it. As long as it is doubtfully from God, and, and no, no one has the power to do from God what Jorge Bergoglio is doing to the Church. No one has that power from Christ to do this. Um, Pope or no Pope, you know, no one receives that power from Christ to destroy his Church. So, I'm just saying this is the very least that we can expect a, a conservative Novus Ordo to finally conclude Look, what he's doing is so outrageous, what he's teaching is so outrageous, there is an objective doubt as to whether or not he really has the powers of the papacy. And we know he doesn't have the powers of any papacy to do this, to attack the faith and to attack the church. So uh, once they do that, they, they, they actually deprive him of the power because they're the ones who are giving him the power to do the damage that he's doing. They are enabling him. They are emboldening him to do this. And every time they charge him with something, whether it's heresy or whatever, and nothing happens, it's just like writing him a ticket. You can do anything you want. Nobody can, nobody can stop you. So they, ha they have to stop doing this, empowering a modernist uh, to, to, to wield his hammers, right? to, to smash down the church. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so uh, anyway, I appreciate the friendly fire here. I assume it's friendly fire, <laughs> but uh, I have to consider it friendly fire because I see that even though the gentleman might not understand what I'm saying, that I, I under, understand his response to be in agreement with what I'm saying. Okay. All right, well, Father, let's end with this really quickly. I wanted to uh, read an email that we received in response to our uh, recent program, the Pope Paris of Francis's Memory. Oh, right, right. And uh, this viewer said that the program was excellent. Father Jenkins laid out in very clear terms much of what he has said in the past regarding modernism and tied it into what is presently at hand within the structures of the visible church. And I largely agree with what he says. To be clear, I say largely agree, because with all due respect, I don't think Father, nor the dogmatic, say to be Conteist sorts, go far enough in really getting to the two main roots of the problems we face now. So these two main roots are conflating apostolic tradition with mere human custom, and the influence of Platonism upon theology. What are your thoughts on that, Father? I'd, I'd have to ask this gentleman some questions to be sure I knew what he meant. Because I could interpret that brief statement he made at the end. I could interpret that in different ways. And I, I'm not sure that any of the ways I'd interpret it would be what he means. Um, he, doesn't, he, he thinks we're not taking into consideration two things. But how he applies these things to what's happened, I don't know. You know? So um, you notice, Tom, um, that when I'm trying to answer a question, I, I can go off on transports. What I'm trying to do is trying to say, okay, well, if this is what they mean, then this, and if this is what they mean by that. I'm trying to interpret a question according to what I think, it, you know, what, what I think that they're trying to get at, what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that is very clear. I'd like to know. Okay. And I would ask that writer to be more clear about that. But, uh, so I don't know what that critique is. I'd be happy to hear it. I will say this, though, <clears throat> that in recent programs I've talked about sedivacantism, which is the one word that has been used to death, okay, <laughs> as a battering ram against so many different things, and um, basically used and abused by anybody who doesn't like what you're saying, and it just accuse you of being a sedivacantist, and that's, you're tired with the, with the brush, you know. Um, and, uh, but I mentioned Sede Negantism as an actual position of those who, who say Francis is terrible, even those who say, well, he's teaching heresy, and yes, he's, he's trying to destroy the church, but, I mean, he's the Pope, and what are you going to do? You know, I think those are Sede Negantists who are basically assisting Francis in destroying the papacy. 
Okay. They are letting Francis redefine the papacy for the home, their church, uh, the Novus Ordo. And uh, he, what he's doing is he's, he's destroying the, the very concept of the true Catholic papacy. And they're helping him, the Seda de Gantis. And that's why Nagans denying, they're the ones actually helping Francis deny and negate the papacy. And I mentioned Seda Cervantism from Conservo to, to preserve, to protect, to guard. And uh, that, is, that is the impression I get from talking to so many people that, you know, they, they don't know, you know, exactly how to define heresy. They know um, statements against the faith when they hear them, you know, things that offend against the faith, and they can hear them in Francis, but they can't make theological arguments about heresy or not heresy, what the consequences of heresy are. But one thing they're all agreed on is they, they, they want to protect the faith from Francis. They want to protect the church from Francis. They want to protect the papacy from Francis. And uh, they realize that uh, uh, by, by saying that he is the pope, he has the powers of the pope, and there's nothing anybody can do. We have to stand back and just watch him destroy this, destroy everything. They are, they are the ones who are giving Francis the tools to destroy the church. They're cheering him on almost, you know. And uh, even at the same time, they're saying, well, he can't do that. But they're saying, but, but he can, really, can't he? Um, and so they, they are the ones who actually are coming to the conclusion that there is at least an objective doubt about whether he has the power. They, they say nobody has the power to do what he's doing from God, but they take that then to the next logical solution is, well, is it, can he even be the Pope? Can he even be a Catholic Pope and do these things and say these things, okay? That is a very honest and sincere and worthy question that needs to be addressed. And the fact that there are those who are saying, no, you can't even ask that question, that's, that's wrong. That's not Catholic at all, you know? Um, in fact, as Catholics at various times throughout history, whenever there was an unworthy pope, asked that question. And they were never told, you can't ask that. But these people are now saying, well, you can't even suggest that. Well, who do they think they are? Uh, they have no right to, to shut people down for asking that question, or for doubting, you know, on the basis of what Francis is doing, and what John Paul II has done, and, and what the others have done before them. They have every right to ask that question. They have a need to ask that question, actually. We have to ask that question. So I think the Sede Cervantes are the ones who are, are see the need to answer that, ask that question. And uh, many of them come to the conclusion that logically, no, you know, it can't be Supreme Pontiffs. They can't be Vicars of Christ Center. Others, not so much. But in any case, even calling it into question, uh, does disarm Francis and takes the, the wrecking ball right out of his hand. Father, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think St. Robert Ballerman, he was of his own personal opinion that um, it was not possible for a, a pope to become a heretic or a, or a pope to lose the faith. And while he thought that was his logical conclusion that this could never happen, he went ahead and addressed the question anyway because he was personally convinced that this would never happen. But, like you say, this is only a logical conclusion, not a theological conclusion. And so he, he went ahead and asked the question. Yeah, the Church has never said that. The Church herself has never said that a pope cannot fall into heresy. And there were theologians such as Cajetan, mm -hmm. who said that, well, he certainly could. And, and St. Uh, Francis de Sales acknowledged that possibility. And there, there are also many others who, who raised that, that specter of a pope falling into heresy. And the general consensus is that they, they would consider Harris to be, to, to be like death, like he died or lost his mind, become irrational. But, you know, if you lose the faith by professing um, heresy, uh, which is losing the faith, right, um, then um, you cannot be the, the member of the church, right? I mean, there are consequences to heresy and that. Even suspicion of heresy, where someone has to be confronted with the fact that what he's teaching is heresy, and he's given so much time in canon law to correct it. And if he doesn't, then it passes from 
suspicion of heresy to the, the charge or the accusation of heresy against him. So, um, in any case, I mean, people are, are all lately all bound up with Francis's question of heresy, as though that's the single question that matters. Meanwhile, while they're bickering about this back and forth among themselves, I'm talking about the conservative Novus Ordo, you know, types. Uh, Francis continues his rampage, and the wrecking ball keeps landing and smashing <laughs> more and more of the church, and the fire keeps burning, you know. And, uh, you know, we saw Notre Dame up in flames. It was a horrible sight. But we also saw the firefighters come and extinguish the flames. <clears throat> well, here's the problem, okay? We have the church itself, and you might say that the church is in flames right now, okay? And the firefighters arrived to put out the fire, and the, the conservative Novus Ordo types, like Dr. Kwasniewski and others, say, oh, no, you can't do that. You know, it says keep off the grass. You can't do that. You know, you have to stay away. And they're preventing the, those who would try to put the fire out and save the, uh, save the church, save the basilica, you know, so save, save the structure. So in any case, um, they have to um, uh, realize that the, the keeping off the grass signs are, are not uh, are not in, meant by God to uh, to simply let the structure be be smashed to bits by the modernists. If you read uh, the the last third of Pope Pius the Tenth's encyclical on modernism, you see where he becomes very practical in his prescriptions of what the Church must do to protect itself against the modernists. Go to the last third. I mean, a lot, of people, a lot of people read the encyclical, but I don't think they ever make it quite that far through the first two thirds. But if they were to get past that, and they would come to the last third of the encyclical, they would see that in Pascenti de Medici Gregis of 1907, Pope Pius X actually, being the man of action he was, lists a series of practical steps the church must take to defend itself against the modernists. And uh, one of them was the vigilance committees that needed to be set up at every single diocese. The triennial report that had to be made, specifically on the matter of di the actions of the modernists within every diocese. But Pope Pius X insisted that there be the teaching of scholastic philosophy and theology, uh, the true Catholic understanding right, of wisdom and of revelation. But he also admonished the bishops, do not tolerate any clergyman who has any taint of modernism. Do not promote him. Do not give him any power. If you have clergymen in your diocese or whatever, or it's, it's talking equally to religious, religious communities too. If you have a clergyman who is a modernist, you must remove him immediately. You must not empower any of these modernists with any authority in the church. And um, when John the Twenty Third got was chosen, right? Um, he was suspected of modernism. We know that. Well, that's the very least you could say about him. And he began to empower all of these modernists. And three, there you have Francis, um, who is. A modern, his very DNA just screams modernism, right? And um, he's modernist right down to the DNA. So, uh, but Pope Pius X said you cannot allow him any authority because the modernists will use that authority, the power you give them, to destroy the church. We see the wisdom of his words, the reality of it now, and. Uh, so now we have to see the wisdom of what he commanded us to do and how we, he commanded us to respond to this and how we must react to this and care. To protect our own faith, the faith of our loved ones, and try to, insofar as is possible, even to protect the church. Mm -hmm.
Well, Father, to end on a positive note, we just started the month of June, which is dedicated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. What should Catholics be doing during this month of June to properly honor the Sacred Heart of Jesus? Well, uh, our Lord said, learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, right? And as St. Augustine says, St. Jerome too, you know, our Lord does not say, learn from me because I created the heavens and the earth. Learn from me because I walked on water. Learn from me because I healed the lepers. Learn from me because I did all of these wonders, spectacular things. As though the religious life was to be found in, in doing works of power. Um, some people actually think that the sum and substance, or the apotheosis of the spiritual life is speaking in tongues, as though that's the key, right? Or prophecy or healing. But our Lord said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, St. Matthew chapter 7, that in the end, there'll be those who will be condemned, but they'll protest. They'll protest that, but Lord, didn't we heal the sick in your name? Didn't we speak in tongues? Didn't we prophesy in your name? And our Lord said there in St. Matthew chapter 7, that his response to them will be, I assure you, I never knew you. So it's not these works of power that are pleasing to God. Uh, St. Paul makes that eminently clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which he ends by saying, I will show you the greater gifts. And then he speaks about faith and hope and charity. And these are the things that we need to save our souls. So if you look into the sacred heart of our Lord and you realize that he says, look, learn from me. <laughs> Why? Because I am meek and humble of heart. Now, this gets back to exactly where we started with uh, Dom de Cossade, because this is what it's all about in self-abandonment to divine providence, the meekness of the soul before the will of God and the acceptance of the will of God in a prosperity and adversity, right? There you have the very, the very essence of meekness and the acceptance of the soul and trust to the soul before God. And if we have anything to learn from the Sacred Heart of our Lord, and we must learn this today, when we see all of this happening in the world, because the, the alternative is to lose faith and lose, and lose hope, right? Is to learn that trust in God as a child trustfully has his hand in his father's hand and follows him through everything, right? And never takes his hand out of his father's hand, never pulls away. That's what we have to learn from our Lord. We have to learn um, the words of the Sacred Heart of our Lord when in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, may, he does say, Father, if it is possible, let this chalice pass from me. But he always says, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. We, we have to learn that. We have to learn that from our Lord. We have to learn that from his Sacred Heart. Sure. Father, thanks for being here tonight. God bless you. Oh, you're welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. It'd be nice to do it. Uh, program just on uh, the book Self-Abandonment to Divine Providence by Don Dick Son. Maybe in a future uh, program we can consider that. Yes, sir. We can make that happen. Thank okay. you, Father. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.